slide, the next thing there. This is a patient. Is there any doctors in the audience? Yeah. Can you what do you think is wrong with that lady? Yeah, it looks like she's got a fractured wrist, doesn't it? It looks like a little old lady's fallen over, broken her wrist. Actually, this, this isn't any, other pa any old patient. This is the reason I get up in the morning. This is my mum, um, who, had a, who uh, was in hospital. And the important things here are the date, which is 2010, which is two years after the, the first Francis report. And this line here, which is a seatbelt burn, because she came out of that. She didn't come out of it, she was cut out of it. The whole, the, the police, the ambulance, the fire brigade, absolutely fantastic. Got her into hospital, and that's when the problem started to happen. She had the fractured wrist, the, the um, ENT, or the a &E people said she might have a fractured spine, she might have um, fractured ribs, or definitely had fractured ribs, might have internal injuries, not, not sure she'd survive. She then got into, handed over, and in the handover, everything started to go wrong. They didn't hand over that she might have a fractured spine. They just looked at the x-rays and thought it might be an oste osteoporotic fracture. And I was told by the, new, by the uh, orthopedic consultant that said, she said, my dear, all 75-year-old women have osteoporosis. I said, I'm sorry, my dear. Even David Cameron doesn't get away with calling somebody dear. You know, don't call me dear. She doesn't have osteoporosis. She had a bone scan this year. And we went through, and it, after, I had to intervene 36 times in her care in the week she was in hospital. And I was the one labelled as a troubled GP son. So it's, you know, it's really, it's, and this was two years after the first Francis report. You know, literally she had uh, UTIs that weren't diagnosed. She was referred to psychogeriatricians because she's gone a bit do lally, and it was because she was septic. All these things, just the common basic things. When she, with a broken wrist, the first meal she was given was a baked potato and no one to help her to eat it. So it's those sort of things, just care, you know, basic care. So, um, the, and I met Rob, Robert Francis and, you know, after one of my talks like this, and he said he was, he was really shocked that I actually, you know, I, I had the courage to challenge people. He said he'd spoken to professors and things like that who wouldn't challenge. And it's really interesting that, you know, when you do that, um, but, you know, people are too frightened because they think of the consequences. There might be re retribution, and that's a terrible place to be. So that's something, and this is what, as I say, this is why I get up in the morning, is to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Because if it happened to my mum, it'll happen to anyone. And every time I do this talk, about five people come from the audience and say, actually, that happened to my mum, my uncle, my brother, whatever. Right. So the whole thing about health and well-being boards is that, um, as I say, it was a change in law to make this happen. Um, it's made up of... Um, Health and, uh, CCG's Health Watch and Public Health on the, on the board. Um, it, it, you know, the law changed in 2013, and then now we're sort of three months in. We've had two public meetings in Surrey about uh, our health and wellbeing. But it's, it's absolutely fascinating to, to do, uh, to do uh, the health and wellbeing board because it's just a change, the cultural change between health and social care and the council. Now, there's, one of the things I always say at the board is there's only one public pound, be that health, be that social care, or be the council, because you can't spend it more than once. Once you're in, in the system, you can't, you know, that, that pound can't be spent again. It, you know, you can pass the debt around, but you can't spend it. Um, so Surrey Health and Wellbeing Board, it, we, we set it up as a board of commissioners, not a commissioning board. It's really important that people remember that we're taking all our, our commissioning powers to that, but we can't, we don't commission anything. We make the decisions about what each organization is going to commission. And the other thing is, it's a, it's a safe place where we make the difficult, uh, have those difficult conversations as, as to who, what are we going to, well, the main thing is what are we going to decommission? Because decommissioning is the thing that is important. What we've always done is just layered things on top of each other, not actually look at what we didn't do, or what, what's working well. We take, we, we try and add something in, and then when it's not working within a year, you s scrap it straight away. But it is actually where all the strategic leaders, all the people with the legal responsibility and the statutory responsibility to come, come together and actually have those difficult conversations. The other thing is, I always say, it's, it's, there's only one version of the truth. Because actually, when I said about statistics, you have people coming along saying, well, delayed transfers of care. That's a social care problem. And somebody else says it's that you know, they're not medically fit. And everyone just passes the buck around. And this has gone on for 60 years. You know, and what we need to do is just say, OK, who agrees? Do we agree this is the? the one version of the truth. And, but the trouble is, once, when you get the councillors involved, they start going down there. What, what is truth? What is this? I mean, we, we have this whole, whole thing about, is it religion? Has the Muslims got it right? And I, I said, after about 10 minutes of this discussion, I stopped and I said, look, all I want to know is that we agreed that we're singing from the same song sheet, that's all. And, but it's just hysterical how you get, get dragged down a, a rabbit hole every, every time. So when I, the, 
I say we're unique in the, in the word um, co-chairs. When I first met Michael, he asked me what did the council do, and I said, well, you, um, you tax me and fill holes in the road. And he went, we do a little bit more than that. And, and I said, what do you think health does? He goes, you tell me I'm overweight and give me pills. And I said, I think we do a little bit more than that. Um, but that's the thing, we didn't actually know what each other did. You know, I didn't know what the council do, I didn't know how things were done. He didn't know what health was doing. Health was just something that you went to, got fixed, and, and um, moved on. And it's interesting, because all my friends, one of the things they always say to me, if there's a problem, they go, you're a doctor for God's sake, do something. It's, it's an assumption I have the answers to most things, and, and basically I don't. Um, and the other thing we need to get right in, with this is actually it's, there's no silver bullet thinking anymore. We've done all the silver bullets, we've done all the low-hanging fruit, we've done all that, and you know, we, 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 if, we, if there was a magic thing we could do, we'd have done it. We need to start changing and looking at different ways of working, and the only way to do that is actually by really getting people to, to understand each other's roles and do things differently. So it is where we, we've done the, uh, our roles rather in, uh, as a health and wellbeing board is to do a, a joint strategic needs assessment. And that's something that's been available for years, but no one ever looks at it. It's a big tome that sits in, in, in somebody's office in the public health department, and no one looks at it. No one actually makes any clinical decisions or commission decisions on it. It's a huge amount, huge amount of work goes into it, and no one uses it. And then we, we have to do a joint health and wellbeing strategy. And it really is, again, that is an absolutely fascinating job to do. It, we took about, actually, you know, if we go through, I'll, I'll talk about this bit first. This is the board membership. So we've actually got county council officers as well as elected members, which is unique as well because, it, you know, the council don't work like that. They have the elected people talking and then they have the officers talking, but the two can't mix. And this is the first time they have to mix. And we've also got borough and district on there and also health watch. Uh, which is um, made up, in Surrey, it's made up of three um, groups coming together. Um, it is absolutely fascinating when you actually get, have, see the politics between borough and districts and county council. You know, it's, it's almost like chalk and cheese. You sort of think, hang on a minute, I thought we are on, on the same side. I thought we were all trying to do the same thing. And actually, until you point that out, um, th there is all of that um, sort of animosity and, and, well, it's political. It's all, you know, it's my, my car's bigger than your car, my dad's bigger than your dad. It's all of that sort of thing. Um, but it is, you know, and I do better, and it's getting that, you know, getting on the front page for all the right reasons. Um, these are our principles, and we set this down in, in our st strategy, and so it's, it's actually basically doing everything that's evidence-based, outcomes-related, you know, and doing things early, getting things in there before things start to go wrong. Um, and it is about system leadership, so it's actually us talking to each other. We've been in shadow form for the best part of two years, or two and a half years, and so we know each other quite well, and we have those difficult conversations. And, you know, there have been rows, there have been, you know, difficult things said, but we still come together, and we still meet, and we still, you know, actually now finally understand each other. Um, and actually understand why there's health inequalities. Because it, you know, the Wanless Report and Marmot have said, and Duncan Selby wrote in his... his um, message last week that, you know, health actually only contributes 20% to people's health and well-being. You know, behaviour is 30%, so drinking, alcohol, um, and smoking, and exercise, and things like that, that's 30%. But employment, education, and, um, you know, housing, and, and violent crime, and things like that, adds to 40% of what, how people feel about the health and well-being. And, and that's what we should be concentrating on. We've always concentrated on that 20%, and not the 80% that will make the difference. So the, 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 we've got six CCGs. It started off as 19, and we've been whittled down to six. And it's interesting, when we, I always point this out, that my, my CCG here um, at the bottom, we wear 20 practices, and we're now down to 18. And it's not because practices have left, it's because two practices have closed. So the, the, the recessions actually hit primary care as well. So they were not viable financially and have had to close. But the patients haven't disappeared, they've just been moved into other practices. So those practices, with no increase in number of doctors, have taken on two practices worth of patients. So it increases the stress in the, in the system. So th th this is our strategy. Um, the, the needs assessment, we went, it's a fantastic piece of work. It really goes down to very granular levels and we need to get that, we need to use that in every decision we make. Um, and it, this is the overview. It basically looks at everyone's, um, you know, younger children, older children, drugs, smoking, deprivation, all of that sort of thing. 
Um, and it's, it's important that we remember that, um, you know, the children and young people, they've always been neglected, always been left off. It's, you know, it's the last thing we think about. But actually, we've made it now one of our priorities. It's the first priority is children's health and well-being and their, their mental well-being and their, their safety and safeguarding of children. Because of, you know, we're in the 21st century. You know, we don't send children up chimneys anymore. You know, we used to do that, but actually we should look after them because they're the future. And since we've got an elderly, ageing population, um, we're never going to get uh, enough people to be growing younger than us to actually look after us in our old age. And it's really important we, we, we look after them properly. Because do you know how much a looked after child costs? Is anyone have an idea? Per year, it's about £350,000. So, you know, that's an, each year to look after a child in, 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 this, in the care system. And actually, it's, it's a huge amount of money. If we get it right so they don't go into care, it'd be far better. But the other thing is, I often start with a quote, and the quote is, increasing demand made on the hospital system by the aged sick is one of the greatest problems of, aged, of modern civilization. And do you know who said that? Have a guess. Go on, hands up. I will tell you. It's Nye Bevan in 1949. The only difference between then and now is that in 1949, your, age, uh, your life expectancy was 66. It's now 88. And actually, we're living... 23 years longer than we're expected to on the NHS system. And I found out the other day, I went to Scotland, and the GP contract still has still the premises that you only have two visits in your lifetime. As a, if a GP only does two visits to you, one, one when you're ill and one to certify you're dead. And that's still in the contract. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating, but, you know, the, the new contract coming. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and what, we, what we, we're doing with in, in the Health and Wellbeing Board is actually looking at... Um, uh, looking to talk in a different language, we're actually looking at about, talking about investment rather than saving, looking at you know, being proactive about things and not talking about, you know, we need to make savings, we need to do this, or, you know, because I've worked in the NHS for 25 years now, and there's never been a time when you haven't had to make savings. It's always been cash-strapped, and yet there's an increase in spending, you know, it's worth £110 billion now. It started at £30 billion in 1997. So, you know, there's an increase in spending, but we have to make savings just doesn't make sense. So our five priorities we settled on, I shall tell you the story about doing it. We, we had the JSNA, we looked at it, we got down to 30 priorities that we had to vote on. So the Health and Wellbeing Board voted on it individually. We all had a, a vote and we all said, put up things. And we had a, it, it was a four or four and a half hour meeting where we went through and everyone had to say why they wanted to do something. Alcohol wasn't on our strategy. Even though seven out of ten, seven of the 11 boroughs in, in, in Surrey have got the highest consumption of alcohol. Well, not the highest consumption, the highest buying of it. No one's drinking it because they're all denying they're drinking it. They all store it in the, in the cellars. But it is seven of the 11 boroughs have, have got the highest drinking um, uh, or consumption rates. But it wasn't one of our priorities because the, the councillors didn't think it was a priority. There wasn't a problem. The police don't tell us it's a problem because we don't have alcohol kids on the streets. But we do have lots of people sitting at home drinking two or three bottles of wine a night and not thinking that's a problem. That's the norm, because I don't drink more than my friends. And, but we, it's, we're storing up problems for the future. But trying to get that in, public health were banging the table. GPs were saying it is a problem, but the councillors didn't want to put it in. But we managed to get it in somewhere. It's not in, the, in our five priorities, but we managed to whittle it down to 14 priorities. But it was a really interesting thing of how people believe what health is, is about. And what, then again, also, what... what um, councils think well-being is about because well-being is more more than just health it's actually how people feel it's how they you know interact what you know what, how they spend the money how they you know do they use leisure centers and things like that but we do things so disjointedly that the um uh Rygen, the Rygen borough but sorry Rygen Banstead where I live they did a thing this summer where they allowed children to go to the gyms for 50p a day and it was fantastic for you know child care you know, they were there. My kids were there all all day, every day, doing swimming, gym, you know, um, badminton, you name it. They were allowed to do it for 50p a day. You know, you can't get childcare for that. That's fantastic. And and the, you know, but the thing about it, it wasn't advertised. We didn't tell anyone. Or rather, the, the Brian Banter didn't tell anyone, saying, "Why aren't people using it? We've invested all this money in these gyms, and no one's using them." And that's because you didn't tell anyone. And it, but it got it spread by word of mouth into people and so all my friends all my, all my kids friends all started to use it but it's something that if your GPs knew about it before this scheme went for, ahead we'd have told patients that this is what you could do over the, over the summer and give them a ticket say it's 50p a day go and use it you know that's one Starbucks coffee a week 
you, you know, when you equate it like that, it's, it's really, really, really small amounts of money. So these are our five priorities now, um, which is uh, improving children's health and well-being. That's, that's number one priority. Preventative approach, so actually being proactive in things. Oh, 10 minutes. Um, proactive in things. Promoting emotional health and well-being. So it's actually looking at the whole person, not looking at disease processes and where people are, are going. Um, the adults, older adults' health and well-being, because actually this problem, this tsunami of dementia and things like that, we've known about it for years. We just haven't done anything about it. We just think, oh, it might not happen. If we keep our heads in the sand, it might not happen. But it is going to happen, and we need to be prepared for it. We need to start talking to people about end-of-life care. We need to talk to them about what they want to do in the future. Do they want to die at home? And do it properly, you know, because you know, the one thing that is absolutely certain is there's no one in this room who's going to survive the 21st century. You know, it is, it is one of those things, stark realities. Although 8% of you, you know, believe you will. There is still 8% of people who don't believe they're not going to die. Um, and the other thing, the last thing is to safeguard the population. That brings in the police as well. It brings in everyone into that. So we did the, how we got to those 14 priorities. We took those 14 priorities out to these stakeholders. We had 80 public meetings, not meetings of public, public meetings, where we engaged with about... Uh, 800 people at a time in Surrey in different places and asked them and they all voted on what they thought their priorities were and that's how we got to those five priorities and we also did an online thing um, and got everyone's views together and then the the, um, the uh, public health is really tricky mathematical thing and they actually worked out um, you know what the priorities were and actually did a um, you know a repeatable and um, you know what's the word you can, you can re repeat it and it's something like due diligence on it every year. You can actually use the same strategy and get the same results. So you're not fiddling the figures, and there isn't, you know, so it's, it's a mathematical formula. I didn't understand it, but um, you know, the clever people did. So the other thing that's really important to us as well is public health, because public health has been, you know, the two things that made the biggest contribution to people's health and well-being is public health, which is sewers and clean water and vaccination. Everything else we do is it doesn't really touch like that does. So we need to really prioritise public health and they need to tell us, they need to be our sort of the honest broker in the room telling us actually we're not doing as great a job as we think we're doing and pointing out where we should be you know, investing our time. Because they, they get the statistics. We need to look at that. We need to say, right, show us what we're doing. Um, and, and that's the thing, it's, it's vital to keep us on track. So what they do is they get all these um, you know, in, in health protection improving services and the health improvement and then get the evidence to prove, to tell us how to do this. You know, there's nothing new in the NHS. Everything has been piloted. You know, we've got pilotitis. Everything is done 17, for 17 years before it's good practice and embedded. And we've heard it, you know, all these things we hear at this meeting today is nothing's new. You know, you hear about, you know, new COPD pathways, new this pathway, new that pathway. We've known about, you know, John Oldham always says we've known about that since 1980, something or other, and he just gets really embarrassed that we haven't taken it forward. So uh, I thought I'd just mention HealthWatch. It is actually um, three organisations, Citizens Advice, Independent Living Council and Help and Care, um, who've come together to actually form a consortium, which is brilliant, because they've, they've actually, and this is a terrible thing to say, cleared out the old guard of the self-appointed, you know, quite strident, um, you know, usually ill-informed campaigners who've been there forever basically uh, opposing everything we've been trying to do. So this is actually a, a campaign. These are the people who are elected. They, they come, come together, now appointed as a, as a, a new body. And it's brilliant, because they, they, they bring in advice, Citizens Advice Bureau and um, the uh, Independent Living Council. And what they do, what they're doing is they're holding us to account to make sure that we're delivering and making sure that the public have a little voice in what, what's happening. Um, there's a bit about the marmot thing and about the in, in, index of deprivation. Um, but the thing, the thing about it is, you know, what we need to do is actually improve people's health and well-being. It's not about doing, you know, it's, it's, it, as I said, it's things about how do we think, do things better together. We know all the, all the reasons why, but we just need to try and find a way of working together. One of the things that really interesting, it's a really simple thing. Buses, bus, you know, elderly patients get a bus pass. They only use the bus pass after 9.30 but their hospital appointments at nine o'clock. Why don't we change and ask the hospital to um, do their bus, you know, make their appointments at 10 o'clock? Really simple. 
but they don't do it. We haven't thought about it. It would make a huge difference to those people's lives. They wouldn't have to get taxis or rely on their, they could use their bus passes. It's simple things like that. And also, even like bus routes, can you get, can you get a bus to the hospital easily? And if you can't, why not? So in, in, in those sort of things. Same with, you know, if you're talking about licensing, if there's a problem with drunkenness in a certain area, look at the licensing laws and do something about it. We've actually now, I think we're voting today, I've got the Health and Wellbeing Board after this, and we're voting today to have the um, uh, Chief of Police, no, Commissioner of Police, no, Chief of Police, commission, we've got a Commissioner now, but it's the Chief of Police is going to join the Health and Wellbeing Board because they're the last big Commissioner of, of Care. And it's important that they're at the table. But the, the interesting thing is we have to fight people off joining the Health and Wellbeing Board. Everyone wants to be on it. You know, it's, it, it's seen as the place, and you've heard it. I mean, I heard it from Andrew Burnham yesterday. The Health and Wellbeing Board's place to sort things out. If it was that easy, we'd have done it. You know, why didn't he do it? That's why I want to ask him that question yesterday. Why didn't he do it when he was in power? He could have easily done it, but it's, it, it has had taken that change in law for us to do that. Um, right. So these are the burdens of diseases. Everyone knows what, what the, the causes are. And these are all the risk factors. I don't know why this is in. Um, so what we're looking at is, is things like early identification, and that's the risk management, risk stratification. It's actually changed the way medicine's delivered. And the CCGs will be that. And they're, they're a membership organization. I'm going to keep an eye on time. And membership organizations are a great thing. It's a bit like uh, one of my um, friends said, that, you know, AA's a membership organization, but you don't expect them to go and fix cars. It's the same with, with uh, CCGs. Not every GP has to do the commissioning bit, but they have to, be, they have to know about it. And actually, I've always said that every act a GP does is a commissioning act. Every prescription, every referral is buying something. And it's really important that we remember that and that GPs take that on board. What, what we're doing with this is actually putting a mirror up to the way medicine's being delivered in the NHS and actually looking at all the blind spots, all the things you don't want to see, and actually start saying, how do we deliver care differently? And we're seen as a, as a, a, a myth-busting place, as a place where you can actually have that, I say, difficult conversation. And looking at, you know, not the pass-offs, it's actually saying, you know, where do, where, where's the continuity of care? How do we get that better? Um, we've, we, in, in Surrey, I mean, it's a joke that I've been told not to say, but it, Surrey actually does have areas of deprivation. There are people in Surrey who can barely afford their second homes. No, but we do have, you know, quite a lot of deprivation in Surrey in pockets. But Surrey is still seen as a very affluent area. Um, but there are, you know, we do have areas where, in, in my practice, if you cross the road into a different postcode, your life expectancy goes, goes down by 10 years. And it's really important that, that um, people understand that and, and act on it. Um, right, so you can just read these while I'm talking. Um, so it is basically, now we've got to the point where we actually have mutual trust and mutual um, accountability. We're, we're not going to get it right first time. I say, if we, if we could have got it right, we'd have done it years ago. This is going to be a difficult journey. It's going to be difficult and hard, and we are going to be, the stones are going to be thrown, but you've got to keep going. And I, I keep saying that there's no um, coincidence the NHS was at the front of the um, Olympics. It's because people are proud to be, of, to ha proud of the NHS. The country's proud of the NHS, and it's something that we, we should be proud of. Um, it's the only, it's the, you know, envy of the world never copied. And the reason it's not copied, because no one can do free at the point of care, health care. And we, but we are doing it, and we'll continue to do that. But we have to work together to make that a reality. Um, and the other thing is, we also have to make UK PLC work. You know, we need to be able to sell the NHS and the, the values and the, the, uh, the, um, the, the ability of the NHS to, to, do, to do things like look at new drugs and evaluate them properly, you know, with proper evidence rather than just what, what people uh, want to say. And actually, I, I, I brought this paper. Because the front page of today's um, metro is Generation XXL, massive amount of obesity. The NHS swamped by fourfold rise in, in obese children. Now, whose responsibility is that? Is it the NHS? Is it the government? Is it people? Is it the councils? Everyone's trying to pass the buck, but actually it's all our responsibility, and that's what's important, is to remember it's all our responsibility, and we've all got a bit to, to play in, into that. And finally, just to remind people, the reason why you're here, the reason why you do things, is not because it's your job, it's because you are one bit of that jigsaw puzzle that fits into the picture of the NHS. And people don't know what the NHS picture looks like. They've all got a vision in their own heads of what it is. But there isn't one person who's got that vision, but each bit of the jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle has to fit together. 
And the reason why you do it is because one day you'll need it, and if it's not there, you'll know about it. You know, it's really important. So you need to remember every decision you make, it might affect how you do things, how, you know, or knock-on effect on other, other bits of the system, but it actually, at the end of the day, what are we, what are we here for? It's about make, improving people's health and well-being. We are a m modern society. We should be able to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. We've probably got time for one question. Anyone? Anything to ask? If so, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, gentleman just here. We've got a microphone. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much. That was a, an excellent presentation. Um, in terms of the Health and Wellbeing Board, it looked very inclusive but very large. Do you find that gets in the way of decision making? It's, it's challenging, absolutely challenging. But the thing about it is, if you've got, if you're, what I've always said, if you've got, the, if you're going heading for the same direction, you're all trying to do the same thing. It is actually quite easy. I always try and get people to think how you can, not why you can't. We all know the reasons why we can't do something. I, my, one question I always ask is, how how can you make this happen? And they go, oh, we can't. I said, I didn't ask you that. I said, how do you make it happen? And, and the, and the um, politicians are the same. But the, so it is, we, do, we make decisions because it's the right thing to do. And it's not, not, it may not be best for your organisation, because what, what I've always said is you leave your organisation at the door when you come into this room, because actually, if we, organisations compete and people collaborate, and if we're competing against each other, we're never going to get it right. We've competed for 65 years, and this is the, this is the one chance. And you know, that's one thing I'm, I'm very proud of, is the fact we can do that. So decision-making is easy when you know what you're going for. Thanks very much. Okay, we should move on now. Thank you, Joe.